In this video, you will learn about some more of the operations of the Little Man Computer instruction set. In particular, you will learn how to use decision making instructions that cause branching in your code. In a later video, you'll see some more complicated Little Man Computer programs that include looping. Also, in another video, I'll introduce you to a more advanced simulator with its own, more realistic instruction set. Here's a summary of the Little Man Computer instruction set. In the previous video of this series, you met all of these operations except the branching operations BRZ, BRP and BRA. You're going to see these in action now. To introduce you to the branching operations, I'm going to start by talking you through this program which decides if a number that is input is greater than or equal to 5. If the input is bigger than 5, it will be output, otherwise the number 5 will be output. In this video, I'm using a different online simulator. This one is available from 101computing.net. It has the same instruction set as Peter Higson's simulator, which you met in the previous video of this series, but you can see that the interface has a few differences. Notably, this simulator includes the memory address register and the memory data register, which play a fundamental role in the von Neumann architecture. You need to know about these registers for some high school and college courses. Something I particularly like about this simulator is the commentary that appears in the boxes on the right when I run a program. I can see a log of everything that's happened. However, this is still very much an abstract model of the CPU. There's no mention of the CPU cache memory, for example. But that's OK, one step at a time. I can enter my program here. With this simulator, I've been a little bit more careful about the layout of my program. It's not important for it to work, but I want to make it readable. Now, before we run it, let's think about how it works. The user is prompted for input, which will go into the accumulator. A copy of this is then stored in a memory location, which we've named X. The accumulator will still contain the input value. Then we subtract 5 from the contents of the accumulator. Note that Little Man Computer doesn't support immediate addressing, so we can't use the sub operation followed by the digit 5 here. We have to use direct addressing, that is, we've declared a variable called five, and the number 5 has been assigned to it. I could name this variable anything I like, but the text 5 seems appropriate. If the number in the accumulator is bigger than 5, then subtracting 5 from it will give us a positive result. So, for example, if the value in the accumulator was 20, the result would be 15. If the number in the accumulator is less than 5, the result will be negative. And, of course, if the number in the accumulator is actually 5 itself, subtracting 5 will result in 0. The result of the subtraction operation overwrites the contents of the accumulator. We then have a branching command. This includes the branch if 0 or positive operation, BRP, followed by the name of a label that we want to jump to, in this case, X out. At the label X out, we load the value of memory location X back into the accumulator. This is the original input value that we saved. Then we output it. If the branching command didn't result in a jump, the flow of control continues down the main path, in which we load the number 5 into the accumulator and output it. Notice that there are two halt instructions. Because we don't want to inadvertently output more than one value. I'm going to run the program at full speed first of all. I can change the clock speed here. I'm going to load the program into the memory and then run it. Twenty is bigger than five, so the output is twenty.
On the right hand side here I can see a log of everything that's happened. I'll talk you through some of this in just a moment. Let's test the program again, this time with a value less than 5. And because the value which I input is less than 5, the output is 5. And to be sure it's working properly, let's try inputting a value of 5. And of course the output is 5. I'm going to step through the program now so I can see what's going on inside the registers while it's running. I can step through the program with this button. But before I do, let's just reload the program into the memory. So we've got a fresh start. I'm also going to reduce the clock speed to the minimum. So let's see what happens. That's the first instruction being executed. The first instruction is in memory location 0. Let's input a value. Notice that the current instruction register contains instruction 901, which is in memory location 0. The value which I input has gone into the accumulator, and the program counter is looking ahead at the next instruction to fetch. When I step again, we've stored a copy of the contents of the accumulator into memory location 10. In order for this to happen, the memory address is put into the memory address register. Behind the scenes, this gets sent to the memory controller. The data itself doesn't go directly onto the data bus and then into the memory. The data first gets put into the memory data register. You can think of the memory data register as a doorway to the CPU. Anything that goes out of or comes into the CPU has to come through the memory data register. The program counter has been incremented, so it's now looking at memory location 2 for the next instruction. Let's execute it. This instruction subtracts the value 5 from whatever is in the accumulator. Now because we've fetched something from memory location 11, that memory address is put into the memory address register. Then the number 5 is fetched from the RAM and put into the memory data register. Only then can it be subtracted from the current contents of the accumulator, resulting in this case the number 15 in the accumulator. The program counter is looking ahead at location 3. We're about to execute the branch if 0 or positive instruction. If you take a look at it in the memory, we have the operation code, the number 8, which means branch if 0 or positive, and we have the operand, the number 7, which is the memory address that we will branch to if the accumulator does contain 0 or a positive number. Indeed it did. So now we're about to execute the instruction in memory location 7. If you ever get asked the question, when is the program counter not incremented, the answer is when a branching instruction has just been executed. So now we execute the instruction at location 7. This is a load instruction with operation code 5 and operand 10. The contents of memory location 10, that is the number 20, are loaded into the accumulator. In order for that to happen, the memory address had to be put into the memory address register and the data itself had to come through the memory data register. The program counter is looking at instruction number 8 next, which is an output instruction. And then finally, the program comes to an end. It's well worth trying this yourself, especially if you want to understand the roles of the memory address register and the memory data register. And as I said, there's a nice log here of exactly what's happened during the execution of the program. You can study that at your leisure. Let's take a look at another program. I'm going to copy and paste it into the simulator this time. And let's just tidy it up a little bit. And load it into the RAM. This program uses the technique of branching to find the largest of two numbers that are input, regardless of the order in which they're input. 
The two numbers are stored in variables called x and y. We subtract the second number from the first. If the result is positive, we know that the first number, x, is bigger than the second, y, so we jump to a label called x out. We load x back into the accumulator and then output it. If the sub-operation puts a negative value into the accumulator, the second number must be bigger. So we load the second number into the accumulator and we output that instead. Let's give it a try. This time I'm going to run it at full speed. Seven is bigger than six. Let's try it again. 22 is bigger than nine. And again. 88 is bigger than 55. And it's still bigger than 55, regardless of the order in which I input the values. By the way, you may have noticed that if both inputs are the same, the BRP instruction will result in a jump and output the first number. Here are some exercises you might like to try. Write a program to prompt for a number. If the number that was input is less than 5, it will be output, otherwise 5 will be output. Write a program to prompt for three numbers and add them together. If the total is equal to zero, it should output zero. If the total is anything greater than zero, it should output one. If the total is anything less than zero, it should output minus one. Write a program to output the largest of three numbers that are input, regardless of the order in which they're input. If you'd like to give these a go, pause the video now and I'll show you some solutions in a moment. And here are some possible solutions. This is a solution to the first problem. The program decides if the number that is input is less than 5. If the number is smaller than 5, it will be output, otherwise 5 will be output. It's almost identical to the program you saw which outputs a number if it's found to be bigger than 5. However, if subtracting 5 from the input value results in 0 or a positive value, because the input is bigger than 5, we jump to a label where we load and output the value 5. Otherwise, we don't jump and we output the input value. Here's a solution to the second problem. If the total of three values input is zero, it will output zero. If the total is greater than zero, it will output one. And if the total is less than zero, it will output minus one. The input values are added together. Then we test the value in the accumulator to see if it's exactly zero. We're using the BRZ operation this time, branch if zero. If the value in the accumulator is zero, we jump to a label where zero will be output directly from the accumulator. Otherwise, we perform another test with the BRP operation. If the value in the accumulator is positive, we jump to a label where we load and output the number one. Note that strictly speaking, BRP will test to see if the value is zero or positive, but we know it isn't zero when this instruction executes, because the previous instruction would have already dealt with a zero value. If neither of the branching instructions result in a jump, the accumulator must contain a negative value, so we output minus one. The third problem, find the largest of three numbers, is rather challenging. Here's one approach. The numbers are input and stored in x, y and z. Immediately after they've been input, the accumulator contains the third number, z. The second number is subtracted from the third. If the result is positive, it means that the third number is bigger than the second, so we jump to a label, check x, z, to test if the third number is bigger than the first. If it is, we jump to the label z out and we output the third number. If the first subtraction operation reveals that the second number is bigger than the third, 
we don't jump at all. Instead, we load the second number into the accumulator and subtract the first to see if the second number is bigger than the first. If the result is positive, we jump to a label called Y out and output the second number. Otherwise, we jump unconditionally using the BRA operation to a label called X out and we output the first number. Notice that if the test performed at the label check XZ doesn't result in a jump, the normal flow of control loads the first number X into the accumulator and outputs it. To be sure that this is going to work, we need to test it with every possible arrangement of three different numbers. Three numbers can be arranged in six different ways. So, for example, here is every permutation of 2, 4 and 6 that we would need to check. Now, you may well have solved this problem in a different way. For example, another approach would be to compare the first two numbers immediately after they've been input, effectively discarding the smallest of the two, and then ask for the third number and check if it's bigger than what you've kept. In this program, I'm using three variables, x, y and z, for clarity, but I could have managed without z by recycling one of the other two variables. This third possible solution is arguably the most elegant of the three. The tests are performed and the checkpoints arranged in such a way that we only need one output command and one halt instruction. Examine the code carefully and you'll see that after each test we overwrite the contents of Z with the biggest value. This example makes the point that assembly programming by hand can create opportunities to come up with highly optimised code. If you wrote a program to perform this task in a high-level programming language, the compiler might well generate something that looks more like the first program that you can see here. In the next video of this series, you'll learn how to write loops. This will allow you to perform tasks like multiplication and division.